Hi, this is Mike Wheeler at the Mark uh, Center Alexandria campus of the Institute for Defense Analyses. We're here today with General Larry Welch and we're continuing our discussions on issues that arise from nuclear history. Uh, General, you made the point a little while ago in an earlier discussion about we knew Stalin well. We invested a lot of effort and dealt with him for a long period of time. It's, it's kind of one of those interesting coincidences that he uh, came to power in the early 1920s and he was in power until he died in 1953. And for the most of that time, he was, uh, it, it, the, the power would almost be absolute. There were no important decisions that were made that he would disagree with. Uh, fast forwarding today, Vladimir Putin uh, became president, prime minister first, and then president and acting president in 2000. Uh, actually, late 1999, but in 2000, he was elected for the first time. Uh, even for that brief period of time that he was prime minister and Medvedev was the president, uh, Putin really was the power behind the throne. Yeah. Became president again, this time for a six-year term. Uh, faces re-election in 2018, and all things point to his being re-elected, high likelihood. Uh, if he only served one more six-year term, he'd be in power for 24 years, mm -hmm. and he's from all indications, a fairly healthy man still, so it may be beyond that. Have we invested the effort we need to in understanding Vladimir Putin? Oh, not even close. The, uh, <clears throat> it wasn't difficult to understand what drove Stalin. Mm -hmm. That uh, if you had any contact with the, with the national security leadership of the Soviet Union, during Stalin's time, or even a couple of, you know, a couple of, mm -hmm. of party leaders after Stalin, uh, they were clearly shaped by past invasions and by the Great Patriotic War. Mm -hmm. And so, what what drove them was easy to understand, and we understood their methods, etc. When, when Gorbachev made the decision that the Soviet system had so failed that it was time to let it go, that uh, I don't think any of us really understood mm -hmm. what that entailed, what that entailed to Russia. We used to spend some time at the, in the Joint Chiefs, particularly, say, 1988, 89, when it became obvious that the Soviet leadership was acknowledging the failure of that system. Certainly, we didn't predict 1991 that it would be the end of it, mm -hmm. but you could see Something was coming. They weren't, so we said there are three possible choices. Uh, one is a cataclysmic, cataclysmic ending, because often dictators or deal with the impending, their impending uh, demise uh, by doing something cataclysmic, mm -hmm. start a war, etc. So it could be that, or they might just muddle through for another decade or so, or it might just end with a whimper. Nobody picked number three. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And yet, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. That I was in Russia two days after it became Russia. We were en route to the Soviet Union, a small group. Uh, and while we were changing transportation in Finland, the Soviet Union disappeared and it <laughs> became Russia. Mm -hmm. Took us another day then to get to what had just become St. Petersburg again. The, uh, it was interesting, I'll, I'll take the mayor of St. Petersburg, as an example. 
he made a speech, uh, amazing fellow, is the only human being I ever saw that could talk for 20 minutes without breathing. I mean, he really <laughs> laid out his, but when you listen to him, you thought of the old joke about how you sculpt an elephant. Mm -hmm. You get a big block of concrete and chip away everything and it doesn't look like an elephant. That was his concept of how you build a capitalistic economy. <laughs> you just chip away everything that doesn't look like a capitalistic economy and it mm -hmm. will emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, he had no concept of what it takes to build a capitalistic economy, of how fragile it can be, of how much knowledge and activity. had no concept. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, I was in Moscow and meeting with the senior leaders, and it was very clear that they were very disappointed. They thought that when the Soviet Union went away, then Russia and the United States would become friends, and very soon Russia would look like Western Europe. Because after all, Look what we did for our former enemies mm -hmm. in Western Europe and Asia. And surely, friendship with the United States would make all of these wonderful things happen in Russia. Uh, but he told a story that really stuck with me. I said something, I said something about how you build a capitalistic system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you find the demand, you connect the supply through the demand. It's, and he said, oh, General Watts, that is so American. <laughs> he said, in America, if you envy your neighbor's car, then you just want to get a car like that. And you, maybe you'll take a second job, or you'll sacrifice something else. Maybe you'll go rob a 7-Eleven, but, mm -hmm. but your motivation is to get a car like that. He said, in Russia, if your neighbor has a cow and you don't, you just want to kill his cow. <laughs> and he said, there is no expectation that hard work and good decisions will improve your life. Mm -hmm. And that really stuck with me. So there you, so I put together a couple of things here that, that I think we have difficulty understanding. One is they really expected that ending this conflict with the United States and becoming friends with the United States would lead to a very quick economic transformation of Russia because they saw it happen in Germany. They saw it happen in Japan. It didn't happen in two years, but within two years it was on the way. And this is not happening. Well, it never occurred to them, of course, that Germany and Japan were industrial nations, full of entrepreneurs. It didn't occur to them they didn't have that. You know, they, had, they came from being a peasant society to communism. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, then you fast forward to Putin, and Putin then looks back on, by the way, I think it's very useful to believe what he says. I don't think Putin is deceptive. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's tricky. I think he has made it very clear what, what his attitude is, and that, uh, Putin looks at the demise of the Soviet Union as the worst international disaster that's ever happened. And he blames all the post-Stalin leadership for it. And he believes that to restore Russia to great power status, that it will take Putin. He is clearly a nationalist. And he believes that he is the leader that would have to make that happen. And he believes that we are intentionally trying to prevent that. What do you think about that a moment? That uh, 
I was talking to a senior State Department acquaintance about a month ago, and I asked them, what's the very worst thing that could happen in Russia? And they said, oh, a failed state that has 3,000 nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, why are we trying to make that happen? Why are we trying to destroy the Russian economy, which would be the most likely route to a failed nation? Well, I won't give you the rest of that conversation. Anyway, so I offered to another senior official a little I thought, how about a little thought experiment here for a moment? Assume for a moment that everything Putin says is true. At least he thinks it's true. Assume he's not trying to be deceptive. That his motivations are exactly what he thinks they are. The problems he thinks he's dealing with are exactly what he mm -hmm. says they are. And his objectives are exactly what he says they are. If you could do that, then how would we respond differently? They said, I can't, I can't play that game. I just can't play that game. <laughs> and I said, well then, how do you decide? How do you decide? And my point was, the first thing to deciding, you have to really make a massive effort to understand what motivates the Russian leadership and what the Russian leadership thinks they are facing and what they think will take them down the path to face what they think they are facing. You notice not one time did I say what we think. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to get there with the Russian leadership. That uh, are they a great power? Will they stay a great power? Well, that's part of what we need to understand. Mm -hmm. That it's easy for me to say they've they've got a declining economy, a declining population. That uh, their system just is not working, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't help. If we're going to deal with them in an intelligent way, then we really have to, in my view, put forth the kind of effort that we put to understand mm -hmm. Joseph Stalin. Is Putin a new Joseph Stalin? Not even close. Mm -hmm. He's very different from Joseph Stalin. Is Putin a determined, dedicated Russian nationalist? Yes, he is. And we have to deal with it. 